David Cam tries to shoot him. Why don't you just belt right out of there? If you point a weapon at me, even on a prison level, if a guy comes at me with a shank, I'm going to get that shank from him. And then it's my turn. It's that simple. I'm just going to put it out there. I can't get in any trouble. My intent was to kill David Cam that day. You tried to kill me, and now I'm going to kill you. But before I had a chance to kill him, I stumbled across this beautiful woman, dead, lifeless on the, on, on, on the ground. Then Bonet said he stumbled over the woman's shoes and took the time to place them on top of the Bronco. But then you're down on the floor the way you tell it. You've tripped? Yeah, I did. I tripped over the shoes. And then your motions are going wild. This guy's trying to kill you. You're at a crime scene. You're going to stop? We have to believe that you can say, oh, shoes, i got to put these now on top of the vehicle. Charles, well, that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. No, 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 no. Doesn't see, make any here's sense. the thing. I'm wiping the shoes off, and I see one little leg or something hanging out the passenger side. I go to investigate to see if there's anyone else in the back of the vehicle. And when I leaned in to look, I put the shoes on top. I don't even remember doing it. Doesn't remember doing it, and he says he doesn't know why. Well, I wasn't thinking about why I did that, but I was cognizant and really thinking about the DNA or possible fingerprints from having tripped and touched those shoes. But you know, that palm print, Charles, is just where you would brace yourself to lean across to shoot at that little boy. That's according to a defense expert witnesses. You got to understand the prosecution has that same evidence. They don't see it that way. What I'm saying is if you're so concerned about tidying up, why would you be so clumsy as to leave a big old handprint on the vehicle? I leaned in to check on the children. What I seen there was horrifying. I'm not worried about that palm print. I didn't even realize I, I left a palm print. Do you think that if I had a known, I wouldn't have taken the time to wipe it off? I wanted to just get out of there. Did you touch any of the victims, Charles? No, I did not. So how does he explain his touch DNA on Kim and Jill Cam's clothes? I've touched David Cam. We've shook hands and he handled my sweatshirt. My skin cells are clearly on him. So anything that he touches can be transferred. While the defense couldn't tell the jury about Bonet's past, the foot fetish, the armed robberies, we knew the record and asked him about it. When people understand your criminal history, the fetishes, what happened in that garage seems to fit your appetites. Well, this is this guy's history just played out on a violent scale that he'd never been through before. Well, first of all, my history does not consist of killing women, shooting people, period. I've not ever had anything like that in my past. Yes, I've been in possession of handguns. Yes, when I was 20 years old, I did some armed robberies for cash. Charles, let me put this to you directly. Were you in the garage that night with a gun in your hand, taking control of Kim Cam? No, sir. Kids started to cry. I told you to shut up. Shoot the wife when she comes after you. Richard Cammon's theory is totally wrong. It never happened. In your panic, forget the sweatshirt. Forget about trophies of the shoes that maybe you were going to take later. But for the first time, this sex fetish itch that you have has gotten totally out of control and you've massacred a family. Did you do that? Charles Bonet, did you kill that family? No, sir. In fact, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. A guy with a foot fetish kills an entire family just to satisfy his foot fetish in a place where he's never been before. It never happened. What are you hoping the jury hears today? I have no comment, sir. With Bonet as the wild card, David Cam's third trial came to an end after nine weeks. It's over. But right now, let's wait for the verdict. Would the jurors believe the tale they'd heard? The felon duped into a crime scene by the ex-cop. For the third time in 13 years, his fate was in their hands. I was scared to death. Verdict number three. Would anyone dare predict what this one would be? Everybody kind of had that same feeling, but none of us had the, the nerve to utter it. The jury in David Cam's third trial had the case. For two families, there was nothing to do but wait. The Rangs, Kim's parents, wanted nothing more than to hear the word guilty again. The new evidence had not changed their minds. You believe David killed your daughter and kids? Yes, I'll never change it. Why isn't Bonet's presence enough to explain everything that happened in that garage? It just didn't. There's just too many other things. There's too many stories being told on both sides. And 
you know, I don't believe neither one of them are telling the truth. You have gotten word that a verdict has been reached. The jury took 10 hours to reach a verdict. I said, well, it has to be guilty. I mean, I wasn't expecting anything but guilty. Prosecutor Stan Levko's glass was half full or better. I thought we had a decent chance. I thought it could go either way, but I thought the trial went really well. But Kim's mom was worried. Yeah. I was scared because 10-week trial and you're only out 10 hours. I had a really bad feeling from the beginning that it was going to be not guilty. David, in a holding cell, got ready, shaking violently. I literally could not uh, fix button my shirt or fix my tie and my collar and so on. The deputies had to help me. <laughs> His family, the Lockharts, were heartened by a relatively fast deliberation. Everybody kind of had that same feeling of, this might be good. But none of us had the, the nerve to utter it, you know, because you don't want to say that. Because the hurt, the pain when they say guilty is so devastating. Julie was breathless, waiting for just one tiny word. I'd been kind of trying to practice in my head. What, what will it sound like to hear the word not? Not, you know, we'd always heard guilty. So I'd kind of just fantasized about hearing that word. And that's exactly what she and everybody else in the courtroom heard that day. The word not, as in not guilty, once, twice, three times. You hear the first one, and then you hear the second one, and you're praying to God, you hear the third one, and um, that's when I lost it. You know, knowing, finally, finally the truth has prevailed. Uh, justice for Kim and Brad and Jill, for me, for my family, um, and I just fell to pieces. Not guilty. Not guilty. 13 years. Times three. Yes, sir. 13 years. 13 years of hell. Everybody around me, I thought, was crying. Dave was bawling. I just sat there. I think I was finally saying, we've got this thing done. Finally. For the other side, the parents, the grandparents, the verdict was a devastating blow. When they said not guilty, I, that's kind of like, it just ripped my heart out right there. I mean, like, this can't, this can't be right. What did these jurors see that the other 24 jurors in the past didn't see? You know, he was convicted twice by 24 different people. And these 12 people seen something that they didn't see? David, can you tell me how you're feeling right now? Outside, the cameras were waiting. This is complete vindication after 13 horrific years. This is a miracle. My situation is a miracle that we are here conducting this interview right now. It, God literally had to move a mountain to make this happen. But that mountain would never have moved without dedicated attorneys and Uncle Sam Lockhart. You know, I have been a lot of people saying the only reason I'm doing this is because Dave's my nephew. Well, that's a big reason, absolutely. But I know he's innocent. He didn't do it. And the only thing I knew to do then was continue to fight until we reached the solution that was proper. Finally, the David Camp case, one that had dominated the news in southern Indiana for years, was over. Your name will be clean again, but you know, there's still going to be people that can point at you and whisper and say that's the guy that got away with killing his family. You know family. what? I can't help those, those people. If they choose to be ignorant, that's on them. Um, I've had 13 years of my life taken away from me, and um, it's their problem if they choose to be ignorant, and it is a choice. For those who knew and loved Kim, Brad, and Jill, there remains a yearning to know what might have been for the wife and mother, for the two young children, no telling what Kim might have been, where she could have been, what the kids have been doing. We lost all that. Dave lost all that. David Cam says he'll never get over the pain of what happened in the garage that night. The pain becomes a part of you, and you live with it, and it's an, an element of who I am, you know, and, you know, how I live my life. On the day of the verdict, as a security precaution, sheriff's deputies drove David to a prearranged truck stop and turned him over to his waiting Uncle Sam. That was the moment he was really free, wasn't it? I think so. I think it finally hit him, and it hit me like, this guy no longer is in shackles. 
this guy is with me. He is now ready to go start his life. It's me and one man uh, leaving together, heading home. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. It's an insider's take on politics, the 2020 election, and more. Candid conversations with some of my favorite reporters about things we usually discuss off camera. Listen for free wherever you get your podcasts.